Ready or not, you guys. The Two Tongues Podcast. That's enough music. What's up, you guys? Chris coming at you for another solo episode of the Two Tongues Podcast. We're going to do a little bit of a opinion scholarship again this week. Very excited about that. That's, that's my jam, you guys. Opinion scholarship. I want to talk about the Norse today. Do a little comparative religion. One of my favorite topics, bar none. I uh, found a little book. I didn't find it. Somebody on Twitter suggested it. Never heard about it before. Um, never heard about the gentleman before. His name is uh, Thor Heyerdahl, if you guys want to take a look at that. This probably wouldn't be the one I would I would buy if you're going to buy them. Uh, this one is a compilation of lots of articles about Thor Heyerdahl, but he has written several books. Um, he's an interesting fellow, but he's read written several books that talk about the connections between the ancient Norse, the people of modern-day Scandinavia and Russia, and the people of Azerbaijan. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're not really going to get there until the end. I want to tee this up for you as best I can and talk about something that is connected to the story, and I'll just lead into it, and you tell me what you think. I'm going to call this episode Ragnarok and Heyerdahl's Odin. So this is going to be my attempt at uh, at Norse mythology and some comparative religion today. So I'm going to open like this. You know the sort, sorts of things we talk about on this podcast and how often I will bring up religious stories from different parts of the world in different times and talk about connections between them. I find that just endlessly fascinating. And we're going to do something like that today. So I'll remind you that ancient myths have conspicuous connections across culture, across languages, and even continents. And we've spoken before about many of them, like these recurring themes, like the cosmic egg, for instance, that's there in the creation stories all, all over the world. How creation in, in these religious stories is, is often talked about as a, as a, through a mechanism of separation. And then we have things like the Great Flood, you know, Noah's flood that we see all over. And then we have this end of days idea, this Armageddon or Ragnarok idea. And we, we see them everywhere. We find them in the Bible, of course, but also as far afield as ancient Greece, Iran, India, China, even Polynesia and in the Americas. Today, I'd like to discuss another one. Now, this one often surrounds a war between two races of gods. But more fundamentally, it's about the existence of two separate, distinct, divine tribes. It's strange that we would see two races of gods appearing in ancient myths from all over the world. It's strange, right? Two races of gods? Now, we see this in Zoroastrianism. We talked about that a few weeks ago, and we see it in the Bible. So just to refresh your memory, if you don't think about it in this sort of context, in the Bible and in Zoroastrianism, we encounter a God of good. We generally just call that God, and we encounter a God of evil. So Christians would know that God is Satan. Zoroastrians would know that God is Arima. You may not think of Satan as a God of evil, but think about it a little more. We have this polarization in Judeo-Christianity, and it came from Zoroastrianism. We have a spirit of good and a spirit of evil. They're constantly in, in conflict with each other, a god of good, a god of evil. And, of course, they have their cohort of angels and demons, right? And we see the same kind of thing in Greece, in ancient Greece. If you remember the ancient Greek story, the elder gods, they're called the titans, they're replaced by the new gods that we call the Olympians, right? So we have Kronos and Rhea, the titans, right? The great god and goddess. They fall and are replaced by the Olympian Zeus and Hera. We can even step further back in time and see reflections of the same um, in Indo-European myth that gave rise to Hinduism and Zoroastrianism. In Hinduism... For instance, the gods are at war with one another, separated into groups called devas, led by Vritra, and asuras, led by Varuna. So we have the titans, 
versus the Olympians, the Devas versus the Asuras, God versus the devil. It's also interesting to, to note that the word Deva is related to both the English word divine, which is something we associate with God, um, in particular the, the God of good I referred to earlier. Of course, Deva is also associated with the word devil, right? Associated with this sort of God of evil. For today, I want to focus in on another parallel myth, also within the Indo-European tradition. So come with me as we travel to the frigid north, to the land of ice and fire, and fall back to the age of the Norse. Here in places like Scandinavia, Germany, and Russia, we find two races of gods, and yes, they are at war. We have the Aesir, led by gods like Thor, Odin, and Tyr. And we have the Vanir, who claim Najoro, Frey, and Freya, two tribes of gods at war with one another. Now, I want to share with you the Norse myth, which comes to us from the poetic Edda, preserved by Snorri Sorostorlsson in the 1100s AD. So this is a... Um, a, a myth written down in the Middle Ages, but it's a m much more ancient than that. And we read from the Edda before, a few weeks ago, or maybe it was last week. We read from the prose Edda. This is the poetic Edda. And that, that, the reason I tell you that is because I'm going to read this poetic version, and it's written in Icelandic originally, and it's designed here to be um, sung or to to have this rhyming cadence. You're telling the little kids around the campfire. You're telling them the stories of the ancient gods. It's supposed to be something that is poetic, and it's written in a way that isn't – well, you'll see. It's not as clear as you might like it to be. It's kind of designed to be a little bit sing-songy and memorable. So I'll just open it for you here. The story itself opens with Odin, the chief of the gods. And he calls upon a vulva, which is like a, a seer, a priestess, uh, a woman. I believe he even raises her from the dead. And what she does here is she tells him the secrets of the past from the very creation in the very beginning all the way through to the future, which is the end of time, the destruction of the gods, the twilight of the gods. And that's what they call Ragnarok. If you've heard that word before. Maybe you're a Marvel fan and you've heard that word before. Talking to you, Matthew. So I'm just going to read this. Now, this is going to be highly annotated, but I want to give you a flavor of the actual holy text. This is from the Poetic Edda. I'm going to butcher the Scandinavian words in here, so, you know, fair warning. Um, and I just want you to get a feel for this. Like, it's one thing for me to sit here and talk about Christianity, but it's, it gives you a different flavor when I read from the Bible. And you see that I do that all the time. I want to bring you the actual, you know, accounts from as close to the source as I can. So here we go. This is about the a seer and the veneer coming into contact with each other, doing battle. And it goes like this. This is the words of the seer, the priestess telling Odin about what happened in the very beginning, leading up to this battle with the gods. And it goes like this. The war and the gods spinning all of horror had burned her. On the host his spear did Odin hurl, then in the world did war first come. The wall that girdled the gods was broken, and the field by the warlike veneers trodden. Then sought the gods their assembly seats. The holy ones and council held, whether the gods should, should tribute give or to all alike should worship belong. So I'll stop here for just a second. What's happening here is the gods have got together in a council and they're trying to decide should, where he says here, whether the gods should tribute give or to all alike should worship belong. What, what he's saying is should the veneer and the Aesir be worshipped? Or are they going to destroy one another? Or is one side going to kill the other and, and sit, keep all of the worship for themselves? Do they want to share the space of divinity? And do they want to share the worship of human, of human beings with one another? 
two different groups of gods. Do they want to fight or do they want to get along, right? Something like that. And I'll skip ahead a little bit. It goes, in swelling rage, then rose up Thor. Seldom he sits when he such things hears. And the oaths were broken, the words and bonds, the mighty pledges between them made. On all sides saw I Valkyries assemble, ready to ride to the ranks of the gods. I saw for Baldur, the bleeding god, the son of Odin, his destiny set. From the branch which seemed so slender and fair, come a harmful shaft that Hoth should hurl. But the brother of Baldur was born ere long, and one night old fought Odin's son. From the east there pours through poisoned vales, with swords and daggers, the river Slith. I saw their wading through rivers wild, treacherous men and murderers too. There Nithhog sucked the blood of the slain. The giantess old in ironwood sat, in the east and bore the brood of Fenrir. Among these one in monster's guise was soon to steal the sun from the sky. Their feeds he full on the flesh of the dead, and the home of the gods he reddens with gore. Dark grows the sun, and in summer soon come mighty storms. Then to the gods crowed Gillen Camby, he wakes the heroes in Odin's hall. And beneath the earth does another crow, the rust-red bird at the bars of hell. Now Garm howls loud, the fetters will burst, and the wolf run free. Much do I know, and more can see, the fate of the gods. Brothers shall fight and fell each other. Axe time, sword time, shields are sundered. Wind time, wolf time, ere the worlds fall. Yagrasil shakes and shiver on high the ancient limbs, and the giant is loose. To the head of Mem does Odin give heed, but the kingsmen of search shall slay him soon. Over the sea from the north there sails a ship with the people of hell, and at the helm stands Loki. Now comes to him yet another hurt when Odin fares to fight the wolf. Against the serpent goes Odin's son, and slain by the serpent, fearless he sinks. The sun turns black, earth sinks in the sea. The hot stars down from heaven are whirled. Fierce grows the steam and the life-feeding flame, till fire leaps high about heaven itself. Now do I see the earth anew, rise all green from the waves again. The gods in Ithinvol meet together, and the mighty past they call to mind, and the ancient runes of the ruler of the gods. Woo! I don't know what you think of that. There's more, obviously, but I'm going to stop there. Very highly annotated. You can see the gods doing battle with each other. You can see Odin die. Odin's son die. Um, the great wolf Fenrir and, and Fenrir's um, Ken coming out and and doing battle and the sky turns black and the sun turns black and eventually the earth sinks down into the ocean. So after everything's dead and destroyed and destruction's been wrought and gods have, have fallen and all this torment and terror, what happens? Now do I see the earth anew rise all green from the waves again? And the gods meet together. They talk about their mighty past. They call to mind the ancient runes and the ruler of the gods. So what happens is the world is born anew after it's been destroyed. The gods are resurrected and they come back together and say, well, I guess, you know, fighting wasn't the best choice. So what happens here ultimately is that some of the veneer go to live with the Asir. And this is how the goddess Freya comes to be associated with the Asir originally. She was one of the veneer. Um, and vice versa. Some of the Asir go to live with the veneer. Peace is made, and the races of gods become one, and the world is born anew. So after Ragnarok, after the twilight of the gods and the destruction of everything, the gods are born anew, the world is born anew, and we have a fresh start. And that should remind you 
of, of if you're a Christian or if you're a Jew, it should remind you, and maybe a Muslim as well, um, of the story of, of Armageddon and what happens when Jesus returns, right? And then there's the, a, a new Jerusalem. There's the kingdom of God on earth. There's a new beginning after the destruction, after the forces of evil and the forces of good do battle, and God finally triumphs. So you see that connection here. So now that you've had a taste of the myth, what I want to do is I want to hone in on Odin and on the theme of the story, like the overarching theme. As with any myth, you often have a blending of historical and mythic elements. In fact, it's never perfectly clear if they are symbolic stories with moral or religious lessons or if they are, in fact, histories. We saw this, for instance, in the 1800s when Heinrich Schliemann discovered the city of Troy, which up until that time was believed to be a mythical city with no historical reality. It was a story from the Iliad, right? It wasn't a real story. It was an ancient, it was a story referenced in an ancient myth. It wasn't a real place. And Heinrich Schliemann was like, bullshit, I'm going to go and dig it up. I'm going to follow the, the Iliad. I'm going to find where, where it was supposed to be, and I'm going to dig it up. And he did. And now Troy is a historical city. How about the biblical Exodus story? The Jews being expelled from Egypt? That was believed to be a myth. Until archaeologists discovered that a Semitic people called the Hyksos had been expelled from Egypt during the reign of the Pharaoh Akhenaten. Now, Akhenaten, by the way, was a pharaoh that brought monotheism, a form of monotheism to, to the Egyptians, just like Moses, a monotheist, right? In that same story. So a myth or history. So when we look at the story, what can we say about it? Is it a myth about the battle between races of divine beings? Or... Could it be in some way historical? Or could it be both at once? Now enter Thor Heyerdahl. Now we're going to talk about Thor Heyerdahl, okay? A little bit about Thor. He was a Norwegian ethnographer and amateur experimental archaeologist. I say amateur because he wasn't an archaeologist by training, but he did some interesting shit. If you look it up, there was a documentary, apparently, i never seen it, but a documentary about him where what he did was he built ships, primitive ships made from reeds in different styles, and he sailed from places like, oh, I can't remember if it was from India to Africa, he, he sailed from um, uh, across the Atlantic, uh, trying to prove that tribes could have went from Australia to South America and all sorts of different things like that. He did some crazy, crazy shit, and he failed in some instances, and he succeeded in other instances. And again, there's a documentary out there if you want to check it out. Uh, but that's what I mean when I say he was an experimental archaeologist. Now, he's he's a modern figure. He was born like around the time of the First World War. He died relatively recently, back in 2002. But Heyerdahl has a theory to offer us on our present question. Is the War of the Gods myth, or is it history? Now, Thor's theory is an interesting one. So, he actually took several expeditions to Azerbaijan. If, like me, maybe you're American and you're, uh, your geography knowledge is limited, um, you don't know where the, where the hell Azerbaijan is, um, Google Maps that, you'll, you'll see it. But it's a country on the Caspian Sea. It's just south of modern-day Russia, just north of... Uh, Iran, basically. It's very close to Georgia of the former, so, former Soviet Union, but it's right there in between basically the Middle East and the Russian steppes. So he takes several expeditions to Azerbaijan doing whatever it is he was doing, and he began to see a deep connection between Azerbaijan and his homeland in Scandinavia. I mean, the guy's name is Thor, for Christ's sake. He's, he's Norse through and through, this guy. He goes to Azerbaijan, a place you would never imagine, to see lots of connections to his homeland, and he's seeing them everywhere. 
And he even asserted that the Norse originally came from Azerbaijan, that that was their homeland. All right, to be fair, I was skeptical when I first heard his argument. I was like, really? But my mind has become softened to his perspective. It isn't so far-fetched, after all, when you consider that the Indo-European family tree to which the Norse belong is thought to have originated in the steppe of southern Russia. Also, Azerbaijan's proximity to Russia is fairly close, and the tribe that gave Russia its name, the Rus, were, in fact, Vikings. At this point, I'm sure you're wondering, okay, what's his evidence? And this is where it gets interesting. Firstly, Heyerdahl explored many ancient petroglyph sites in Azerbaijan, which feature images of long boats, not unlike the Vikings. So if you guys don't know petroglyphs, um, these are carvings in stone that last a long time, uh, especially if the stone is very hard. Um, and we can see them in various places in Arizona and in Australia and in Africa. We can see petroglyphs that date back thousands of years, in some cases, tens of thousands of years. So this is what he was exploring in Azerbaijan. And he found not just pictures of animals and hunters and things that you would expect to see. He saw pictures of long boats carved into these rocks. Of course, he makes that connection to the long boats of the Vikings. But then he notes a series of similarities between traditional Scandinavian cultural practices and forms of dance and music and dress that have parallels in Azerbaijan. He was seeing parallels in the traditional culture between the Scandinavian peoples and the Azerbaijani people. Admittedly, these connections can hardly hold up to scientific scrutiny. It could be coincidental, right? But they begin to build a case. It is at this point that Heyerdahl is introduced to a very ancient a very small minority group in Azerbaijan called the Udi, and that changed everything for him. You see, the Udi opened up a religious connection to the Norse, which was so obvious to Heyerdahl, he could hardly deny it. The Udi people refer to themselves collectively as Udin, and Udin is related, nay, nearly identical to the name of the chief Norse god, Odin. Udin, Odin. Heyerdahl points out that artifacts depicting or referring to Odin don't appear in the historical record until relatively recently, until the first century AD from the Roman historian Tacitus. A far cry from the roots of Norse culture and religion, which extend deep into antiquity. So where did Odin come from? And just how the hell did he find himself at the top of the Norse religious hierarchy? See, This is where Heyerdahl is basically hit directly in the face with another linguistic connection. So obvious, it went entirely unnoticed. He remembered his Norse mythology and the key story from the beginning of the Edda, the war of the gods between the Vanir and the Asir. The Asir. Are you picking up on it yet? The people he believed gave rise to the Norse, the tribe that called Udin, the people here. They are Jani. And so Heyerdahl saw the connection. The Azir are the Asir of Norse legend. The Udin are the tribe of Odin. Whew, buddy. Now we can see the myth as Heyerdahl did, as a historical account. He no longer viewed the Edda as a story of the clash of the gods, but as a clash of tribes with different gods. Odin was the leader of the Azir, who traveled north to Scandinavia and encountered there the tribe of Van, the Vanir. And as you would expect in these kinds of situations, there was war and eventually assimilation. 
just as we see in the myth. The Asir and Veneer clashed. They killed one another. They sought domination. And when the dust settled and the blood dried, they became one people. Just as the myth states, their gods unified and recognized one another as equals. I want to note that Heyerdahl's theory remains hotly contested, and I do not take sides from my own perspective. Was Odin a man or a god? Can it not be both? And what might that mean? We know that the Caesar of Rome was a man worshipped as a god, as were the Egyptian pharaohs. We know that great men from deep history are often elevated to the status of a god as well. Someone like George Washington's not far from that, even in America's short history. But however you happen to see it, I think this myth is valid on both the historical and mythological levels. If Odin was a man, this would explain his relatively late historical appearance. If the myth recounts a war between tribes, it stands to reason such a battle would become mythologized. We must remember that ancient people identified with their gods. They were tribal gods, gods of their people, with names from their language. And so a battle of tribes was in a very real sense a battle of the gods. And to the victor goes the spoils. Well, there you have it. That's one avenue.